Let's return now to our earlier stories about the major privacy breach and the new infection at a managed isolation facility in Auckland. Well, joining me now is the Minister in Charge of Managed Isolation and Quarantine, Megan Woods. Good evening, Minister. You must feel like you can't get a break here. When did you hear about the privacy breach? Uh, look, I was briefed on Sunday about the privacy breach, um, the same day that I was briefed about the, the positive case. But look, um, in terms of the privacy breach, um, that the Chief Executive and Deputy Chief Executive at MB, MB that have been dealing with this uh, briefed me about it um, and I was confident that all the right um, processes that needed to be followed involved, involved with the Commissioner, the Privacy Commissioner, were well underway. Um, were you keeping it from the public if you heard out on, uh, about it on Sunday? No, th this was an operational mis um, issue that I was briefed under no surprises and all the issues, that, all, all the processes and steps that needed to be undertaken were well underway. Not very transparent for it only to come out today, though, if you're aware of it on Sunday. Why is that? Well, it was an operational issue that was being dealt with at the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, as it w well should be. I was confident in terms of the people whose privacy um, that it had affected, that they had all been contacted on Sunday, they'd all been telephoned, um, and there'd been a conversation with them, and they knew what to do. So in terms of um, the transparency, the transparency I was most concerned about was the people whose privacy was affected, and I was confident that they had all been contacted. Who screens these workers and makes sure that they understand their obligations working in these facilities? Look, I mean, there's obviously an employment issue here that um, so someone um, it is well below the expectations um, that there would be photograph uh, that people would be photographing lists of people staying at any facility. Doesn't really matter whether or not it's a managed isolation fa fa facility, but any facility and putting it on social media. Um, that, that this was a, an individual that was um, employed by a security company, but it is obviously well below um, our level of expectation of what someone working in one of our managed isolation facilities and while I haven't been involved, what I was briefed on is that individual is no longer working in a managed isolation facility. So are you going to keep using the same company? It's first security this person was employed with. So are they going to keep working with their other security guards at managed isolation facilities? Oh look, the issue of security is something that we continue to look into. Well are there going to be any repercussions for the company? Look, we're continuing to work that, as you'll uh, probably appreciate, in terms of the attention and where we've put our efforts. Um, we've had the officials at MB working on that, but we, we've also put a lot of emphasis on um, dealing with the case of the positive worker um, and dealing with that over the last couple of days. understand that, and we'll get to it, but who does the buck stop with here in terms of this privacy breach then? Look, continuing to work through that, um, obviously um, it is well below anybody's expectation. Um, I am concerned for the individuals whose privacy were breached um, and those processes were followed. OK, so let's turn now to this maintenance worker who's um, been discovered to have COVID-19. What's the working theory for how they got infected? Well, in terms of the knowledge of how we got infected, that's something we continue to investigate. Um, I think it really does point to just how tricky and insidious this virus is because there is no um, direct line of how it is he got infected. What we do know um, is that the genomic match um, for him is someone who was transferred um, from Ridges, a positive case, who, who had arrived from LA, who arrived at Ridges on the 28th of July and was transferred to the jet park after returning a positive test was transferred on the 31st. Um, have, both have the same strain, um, a B1, uh, but the, the, the mysterious part of it and the bit we're needing to continue to do some work around is um, there wasn't any contact between... Are you sure of that, Minister? Are you absolutely yeah. positive there was no face-to-face -face contact? Oh, look, um, as sure as we can be. So that's um, as a result of the the, test, the um, contact tracing interviews that have taken place. But look, we've also taken that of precautions. So we've had a look at the um, the card access on rooms um, and people swipe cards around the building. We've had a look at CCTV footage. Um, so we're as sure as we possibly can be um, that there wasn't... Um, that there wasn't a contact between these two. What we do know um, is uh, that the, the maintenance man had been in the room, but the woman was, um, in, but that was several days before she arrived. It okay, was, um, to can fix we just be in to fix the shower, but the okay. room was not entered even after she left for fourteen days. All right, can we pause for a second there because this timeline is really important. So the room mm -hmm. was cleaned on the fourteenth of August, correct? 
That's right. She left on the 31st of July, so nobody enters the room after she leaves or before the room is cleaned. You're positive about that? Yeah, well, that is the uh, information I've had, and certainly also the, the card access to the room also shows that that's the case, that um, there's no swipe access into that room. So what day did he room. enter the room? What date did he enter the room? So he was he was in the room on the 21st and the 23rd of July. On the 21st to fix a television, and on the 23rd to fix a shower, I believe. Okay, so he was already displaying symptoms on the 11th of August. So... That suggests he was infected before he entered the room. No, um, he entered the room on the twenty first of July and the twenty third. Right. Um, that his his he was he was first described as showing symptoms on the eleventh. He had his test on the thirteenth and returned on the sixteenth. What we know and what um, the director general has told me about the 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 positive tests that he returned it showed that actually it was it was a reasonably new infection. So the, okay. those dates don't match up. Um, in terms of the the idea that he had COVID when he went into the room on the 21st and 23rd. That is not what the evidence suggests. But she hadn't even been in the room by then. No, she hadn't. And that's what I'm saying. This is what this is why we're continuing to look at it um, and, to, and to figure out what how this may have spread um, and how it may have been contracted. So are you sure that the woman had it first and the maintenance worker had it second? Can you even be sure about that? Look, in, in terms of the advice we're getting from the medical experts and the clinicians, in terms of what the tests are showing, that certainly is the sequence that they're telling us. And so we're as sure as we can be within the bounds of the, of the expert advice. OK, so let's talk about the cleaning of the room. What quality control is done on cleaning? How do you know it happened oh, and it was up to scratch? Oh. Oh, look, the, the cleaning of the room, I think we need to kind of dismiss any idea this is like housekeeping going in and doing a normal clean of a room. That um, What we do is um, is a very prescribed set of cleaning uh, that starts actually with the donning and the taking off of the PPE that the person going in to clean the room um, has to use. Um, and it's what, what the room was actually cleaned with was with a hospital-grade cleaning level. It's for the hydrogen peroxide oxide vapor sanitisation using a machine called a BioQual machine, uh, which is used in hospitals. So we're right. talking about um, deep, deep decamin, decamin, con, decontamination. We're so the likely scenario what then... What happen in a hotel in terms of room service. Right. So the likely scenario then, Minister, it seems, is that there's a third party that connects the two. Would that be fair to say? Uh well, look, actually, there's no evidence of person to person because we, what we've had is a, is, a, is a large number of tests coming back, certainly the the um, close contacts of the maintenance worker um, coming back from that facility, and they've all been negative. So there is, actually is not a person in the chain to suggest person to person. Or you so just haven't found them look. yet? No. Yeah, and that, that is a scenario why we continue to look, and that's why we're retesting every staff member at Ridges today to make sure that we're not leaving any stone unturned. We also need to think about whether or not there is any any chance that there is surface transmission there as well. OK, so the worker returns the positive test on or around the 16th of August, right? And on the 16th. Yep. Yeah, so you also note in a press statement put out today that he had symptoms from the 11th of August. So why was he at work? So he described himself in his contact tracing um, interview as probably being having the symptoms and when he thinks about it in ret- retrospect from the 11th, he was, I'd like to point out, he was having his daily health checks where he was having his temperature But that failed then, didn't it? Going, Minister, it failed if he had symptoms, well, self-recognised no, symptoms and he was still at work? No, I think in retrospect is the, is the important important word there. When he when he has gone back and reflected uh, that he's said, yeah, probably what did have some symptoms, if I think about it back to the end. He did, in terms of his health check, um, his temperature is taken. So I have had a health check every time I go into a managed isolation facility. They, they point the... But Minister, the and I'm sorry to interrupt you and, here, but it does show a failure if... Even if you're saying he's reflecting back and saying he had these symptoms, clearly the system doesn't work. If you can have a worker who has symptoms, they are not disclosed or they're not recognised as a reason to stay at home, that's a failure in screening, isn't it? 
Oh, well, I think one of the complications with this case for this gentleman is he does have an underlying health condition um, that does involve him having a cough. So that um, he, he put down his cough to, to his underlying condition. But I think when he's gone back and thought about it, he's thought, he's thought yeah, maybe it was, it was. When I think about it now, I've got a COVID test. But look, we're, we're thinking about every process that might need to change as a result of this. Um, what might need to be put in place. I think what we're seeing here is um, that this isn't um, a case of COVID getting into the community because of any system breakdown in our facilities. This isn't about someone breaking in or someone breaking out. It's not someone not doing what they should. Um, this shows how tricky and how insidious this virus is and how we continually have to evolve our systems to ensure we're keeping ahead of it. Before you go, Minister, can I get a yes or no on this? Are you aware of flight crews or any Air New Zealand staff at the border refusing tests? Uh, that's not something I would be aware of. Appreciate your time this evening. That is Megan Woods, who is the Minister in charge of managed isolation and quarantine.